All right, guys, what is up? This is it. It's the return of Meta Mondays. For those of you guys who might not know what Meta Mondays are, which might be a decent amount of you guys because I haven't done this series in a couple months now. Basically, it's where I go through Meta Stats, talking about decks that I would recommend to you guys now and make a tier list across Meta decks. It's a very thorough process on my end when I go through the full update. Currently, this last one, I spent about eight, uh, eight or nine hours going through all the stats, going through all the different variations of decks and finding the best possible lists and the ones that I would recommend as well. To be perfectly honest, part of the reason it kind of fell off was because I do them so thoroughly when I, when I try to do a meta update. And when I tried to force them weekly, it became just a crazy amount of kind of pressure and work that I had to do. And I think it kind of didn't work out for me. I think that moving forward, I will have to, at the very least, if there's not major updates, maybe delay them to, you know, once every two weeks. At the end of the day, I don't know if I can commit to a schedule because in a lot of cases, you know, the meta is going to be kind of more apparent than others. I want to wait a few days after expansion until we can get a good idea of what's good and then show you guys the decks that are performing well and, you know, people are agreeing are good. As always, in the pinned comment under this video, you can find the link to the site where you you can import any of these deck codes in this video for yourself. You can also check out slightly more updated versions because I do update the site as I go. All right, that's it. So let's go ahead and start the meta update. So we had an expansion five days ago. It was the Cosmic Creations last set of Targon. And there's a lot of new decks flying around. A lot of things are pretty viable. And there's a lot of things that actually have tier one potential that just might not be refined yet. But we're gonna go ahead and go off these stats and you know a little bit of an extrapolation. But starting at the top with Ezreal Draven Burn. Now, this is a pretty difficult deck to play, all, you know, all things considered. It plays very much for the controlly kind of play style, but we also own the board. Overall, it's a flexible deck. I'd call it a mid-range deck, although it's kind of a weird categorization in this game because we are running a ton of controlly elements. Basically, Ezreal Draven is a deck built around trying to cycle its tokens that you generate off of, you know, cards like Draven, Ballistic Bot, and Chumpwump, the cards that these create in hand, discard them with Rummage or Sump Treasure, turning them into actual cards, and just kind of play for an efficient value game plan, putting small amounts of pressure on them until you end the game with Captain Fron's Inevitable Decimates. Also, this deck comes in with a very impressive 59% win rate, deserving its tier one spot. Now, this is a fairly older archetype, but it's got some new tools with the expansion. Some of you guys might have seen the video, uh, 12 new decks, where we tried to build like a Riven version of the deck. Unfortunately, Riven's three mana, three four Stalin is not as effective in the current meta, so ultimately she's just not quite as good as Ezreal, so I ended up switching back to Ezreal. I'm also going to talk a little bit about how we're doing stats. I'm checking the win rate stats of the combined MMRs of Masters, Diamond, and Platinum, and weighing them uh, for, you know, more so Masters than Platinum. So overall, it's kind of like a Diamond average. Keep in mind, the win rates are going to differ a little bit between each independent rank, but Today, we're actually going down to gold as well. The reason for that is because the season just reset. So pretty much, you know, everyone who was in diamond is in gold now, so on and so forth. So pretty much for the purposes of, you know, skill, we're gonna see the same stats as, you know, we would normally in diamond. All right, next up, we've got everyone's favorite deck, TF Go Hard. Now, TF Go Hard has a similar, like, cheap unit and value playstyle. We're cycling a ton of cards to be able to get into our win condition, which is eventually playing enough Go Hards to get the powerful pack your bags, which will usually end the game on the spot. Sometimes we'll be leveling up Twisted Fate for the win as well. TF Go Hard is incredible against aggro decks in general, so if you're looking for something to beat aggro, this is going to be a great choice. And it also comes in at a 56% win rate overall right now, which is actually a little bit lower. It's very possible that TF Go Hard is getting countered by some of the new things out there. Personally, I suspect it'll stay in tier one, but we'll have to see next week. If you guys are looking for tips on how to play these decks, I don't want to mention them all during these videos because they'd go on already way too long. So, you know, you can check out the site and read the comments more closely if you want either kind of like more tips to get you started on a deck or if you want to get more into detail about lower tier decks, which I don't cover in the video. 
Anywho, next up we've got Plaza Scouts. Now, the Grand Plaza is probably the most powerful of the latest cards to hit in this expansion. Probably pretty close competitor with Ballistic Bot, but man, Grand Plaza is just as crazy as we thought it would be. This card is making Demacia single-handedly return to their former glory, and it's, you know, not that hard to see why. It's just a crazy effect, and there's not a ton of, you know, I mean, there's some removal for landmark like Scorched Earth, but it's not even, like, that devastating when it happens. Now, there are a ton of Grand Plaza decks going around right now. People are running them with Shadow Isles. People are running them with Freljord. People are running them with Noxus, even. People are running them with Targon. But the one that's performing the best, and I think personally makes the most sense, is Plaza with Bilgewater. Now, the reason being, of course, you know, we have access to Island Navigator, which is an incredibly potent card for after the Grand Plaza turn, and Double Trouble, which is actually really, really, really powerful. It's a bit of an underrated card. It's effectively a better version of Petty Officer, but we can use Spell Mana for Double Trouble, which is insanely important in the Grand Plaza deck, because how this deck plays a lot is we can skip turn one and turn two, and then go into Grand Plaza on three, and then depending on whether we're attacking on turn three or turn four, we can use Double Trouble on that turn with our spell mana and basically get the two units that both have the plaza buff, it's very crazy. This deck comes in at a ridiculous 60% win rate and it's, again, not that hard to see why. This is a crazy deck. Now again, there's many, many different ways to play Grand Plaza, and I can't guarantee that this will end up being the best one long term. Now, there's even a few different Bilgewater Grand Plaza decks. This one is the one I prefer, the one that has the higher win rate, and I've kind of tweaked the ratioing a little bit here, but we build a slower version of the concept. This is actually not very similar to Misfortune Demacia decks we had in the last update. Those were when Scouts was played as a bit of an aggressive archetype, whereas this is Demacia kind of returning to its old form like six months ago with Garen and kind of like the single combat rating Guardian, more win condition. The reason being is because Grand Plaza forces your strategy to slow down quite a bit. Garen works well with slower strategies and it also works very well with Grand Plaza in general because of course you can challenge with regen and when Garen levels up you'll be taking that as kind of like the timing to close out the game. Now don't get me wrong the Quinn version is totally fine as well if you want to run Quinn in this slot there's nothing wrong with that but I do like this slightly slower version a little bit better. The other thing about this deck is you'll notice it is easy to play as seen here and all you have to do is make sure you're mulliganing aggressively for Grand Plaza. I'm not joking when I say kick basically everything that's not a Grand Plaza or a Misfortune. Some sometimes you'll keep Fleet Feather Tracker, but it is when you have Grand Plaza, if you also draw Island Navigator, Grizzled Ranger, or Double Trouble, you are big chilling. You've got a crazy early game combo that will likely just close out the game from an early position. Overall, while Grand Plaza may be powerful, I do actually expect its win rate to diminish a little bit over time. I think that a lot of the other high tier decks will end up trying to counter it, and I don't know if it'll get knocked out of tier one, but I don't see it being quite like the super meta cancer sort of thing that a lot of people are fearing right now. Although, I mean, honestly, it totally could be. Next up to close out tier one, this is Field of Rush Control. Now, Field of Rush Control hasn't been played a ton since the expansion. We don't have enough uh, sample size for win rate data on it yet, but it was a tier one deck before the expansion, and unless Plaza is enough to single-handedly dethrone this deck, we should expect it to be very, very good after the expansion as well, as it does have positive matchup tables into decks like Ezreal Draven and TF Go Hard. This is a prototypical control deck. As you'll notice, it is difficult to play. The control playstyle in Legends of Runeterra is very counterintuitive and involves a lot of aggressive passes. The, why control is so good in Legends of Runeterra season after season is because the ability to play reactively is really premium, and you should almost always wait for the opponent to play something first, right? Because we have the late game, if the opponent passes in reaction to your pass, they're almost always, you know, burning 
equivalent mana, and in that case, you're getting to the late game, and that's better for you. So pass very aggressively with a full control deck like this. Most of your turns should start with a pass, unless if your opponent passes back and then open attacks you, you're gonna have a problem. You should basically pass except for that one situation. Anyway, this is a deck that will try to just counter whatever the opponent's doing when they attack in, you know, at the start of the turn, open attack. We can counter them with like Flash Freeze and Harsh Winds to stay alive. When they develop into their attack, we can frighten them with Ruination or in the early game, Avalanche. Basically, we've always got an answer to what the opponent is doing. Take it with Feel the Rush at the very end, and you've got the finisher to beat all finishers, and it will often end up killing them on exactly that turn alone. All right, next up, we can get into the tier two decks. There's a lot of tier two decks, a lot of different ways to build, and these are mostly going to be where a lot of the new cards land. We've got Lee, Victor, and Zoe, all fitting into different ways of playing them in tier two. And there's a lot of different ways to get this, you know, kind of middling win rate, like 50 54 to 56 percent on average now i will clarify this is you know a bit of an average and with data there's always a lot of like sample sizing and interpretation and i think that's why personally i'm listing fiora shen in tier two as opposed to tier one now this is my specific version of fiora shen that i built with kuvira and i think it's very optimized in fact the stats would agree putting this exact version at a 63% win rate, and that is not me misspeaking. However, the reason I have it at the top of tier 2 instead of the bottom of tier 1 is because it comes a little bit lower on the average stats when compared to other versions, and the sample size for the 63% win rate isn't that big at only 300 games played. We'd like to see a higher sample size than that. Additionally, I do expect fewer Shen decks might start getting bullied out as Grand Plaza picks up in popularity more and more. So, you know, I, this deck's my baby. I love it. I've brought this to a couple of different tournaments, but I don't think I can list it in tier one, just, you know, in the current meta environment right now. Anyway, what is Fiora Shen? Well, Fiora Shen is a beefy mid-range deck where we're running a lot of the Demacia value cards, some of the challengers and some of the barriers, and we're trying to win off of generating enough board value and just grinding out slow games, usually using this card, River Shaper. River Shaper is extremely key to the deck because if you keep him alive or keep him striking with stuff like Concert, strike he will draw you a card every single time and this card can easily draw you like four spells which has you know gives the opponent a really large problem in terms of being able to win the game at this point most notably we're running the power card deny to beat out threats like ruination and harrowing which is insanely powerful in this meta because this is basically the only competitive deck running deny except for maybe lee sin uh, lastly, we've got the Shen Fiora Champion Bundle. I think a lot of people think of this deck uh, kind of erroneously as a Shen deck. We're pretty much never leveling up Shen. That's why we've cut down on Repost. That's why we cut down on Prismatic Barrier. Shen is here to just give River Shaper value, to give Barrier to Fiora as well. He's just a good value card, and he works really well with the game plan and the fact that we need a 4-drop as a whole. Fiora, however, is a card this deck is going to be playing for because there's a lot of matchups where Fiora being able to kill four enemies and you protecting her with your barriers, with deny, with nopify, ends up being how you win the game sometimes. So a very key component in this deck. It's a Demacia deck. Demacia is just kind of like out grindy beefy decks and you can definitely, you know, expect what you're going to get here. It's a bit harder to play than, you know, something like a Grand Plaza deck that just goes in. You do have to leverage your resources quite a bit, but it's still relatively straightforward. All right, next up in tier two, we've got Endure Aggro. Now, Endure Aggro squeaks in at a very powerful 58% in the past three or four days, but uh, I make sure to try to only list things in tier one when they've been kind of like proven with a good sample size over a decent period of time. Endure has always had a solid win rate in uh, like high ranks, but it's had a very low 
play rate, very low sample size to back that up, with the exception of the past several days, where it kind of exploded as a popular deck due to, you know, it seeing play in, you know, tournaments. I guess I, I should actually clarify on this thing, because it does, it just says has the win rate, and I should put, like, has held that win rate for, you know, a week or 10 days or something. Like, that's... <laughs> because it's been like that for a while, but I, I should update that. Anyway, Endure Aggro, for those of you guys who don't know, this is a Shadow Isles aggressive deck. It actually plays very similarly to Fearsomes. We're using Wraith Color Allegiance as well, but in this case, we're not running all the Fearsome units. We're not running so much Spider Synergy, and we're not running even Mist Wraiths. We're running Wraith Color without Mist Wraith, just because it's a very powerful value unit. And we're doing this all to run this card, They Who Endure, which usually you'll play in this deck on turn 7 or 8 as it's like a 10-10 or a 14-14, somewhere in that range. A pretty powerful unit to kind of back up your aggro game plan. Uh, sometimes this deck will just steamroll them and kill them without needing Endure at all. The biggest thing that differentiates this deck from Fearsomes is that we are running this card, Cursed Keeper, and all the support cards for this. Basically, we are playing a much more sacrificial package. We sacrifice an ally with Blighted Caretaker, we sacrifice, you know, that can be Curse Keeper, we sacrifice an ally with Ravenous Butcher, and we can even sacrifice allies with Glimpse. In doing so, we trigger various effects, Caretaker summons a swarm of saplings to mow your opponent down, etc, etc. And Bark Beast is also growing at the same time. Lastly, we've got this card, Pesky Spectre. Pesky Spectre, as expected, is actually hitting some like Shadow Isle style combo decks, as the fact that for zero mana you can just play a unit that is a premium sacrifice target with something like Butcher or something like Caretaker is actually really powerful in early positions with a deck like Endure that's playing Cursed Keeper and Blighted Caretaker. It, think of it kind of like, it, it's not about the Last Breath. The Last Breath is kind of icing on the cake. Sometimes they will draw a copy of it, but it's really more about the zero mana trigger. Like, for example, we can play a turn one that goes like Bark Beast into Pesky Spectre into Butcher and then attack on turn one, something like that. Or we can use it with Caretaker without it costing us the mana. And because of this deck's like early aggressive combo nature, that zero mana is just so important. Overall, this is a pretty high rolly deck, right? Sort of similar to Grand Plaza aggro decks in that way, where if we draw, you know, and there's a lot of powerful combo to draw you know if we draw like cursed keeper into caretaker or cursed keeper into butcher and you have to kind of like do a little fiddling sometimes you have to force the combos just by taking intelligent mulligans it's actually not super easy to play which is why we put it into the medium difficulty here but it will often just end up drawing a crazy opening hand and blowing the opponent out super fast. So if that's the aggro deck you want to play, uh, Endure is a great deck for you. I really wanted to list this one in tier 1, but just because it hadn't had a win rate for long enough, I decided against it. I'll actually be playing this uh, on my stream on Twitch in the next couple of days and trying to see if I can optimize this a little bit better or confirm its tier one status. All right, next up we've got Fearsomes. Fearsomes, the other Shadow Isles aggro, kind of twin to the Endure play style. This one comes in this week at a 56% win rate, a little lower than Endure, but with almost triple the sample size, making it, you know, a lot more statistically confident that it's, you know, a solid deck. This one uh, has been kind of like an anti-meta deck bouncing in and out and it does very, very well against certain matchups, like, for example, Tom Soraka and TF Gohard that don't really have a lot of fearsome blockers and just, can just get mowed down by this. Basically, we have as many units as possible have the fearsome keyword, which they have to have a three uh, plus attack unit to be able to block. What that means is we're kind of turning off opponent chump blockers, and right now we're in a meta where little chump blockers are kind of premium. A lot of decks try to go wide with a lot of weak units, Units like House Spider and Ezreal Draven, or you know, Hapless Aristocrat, etc., and Fearsomes can just run them over. Most importantly, we've got three Harrowings as a Hail Mary for when the game goes a little bit later. Fearsomes overall are pretty easy to play, they're easier than Endure Aggro. Um, you do have to sometimes do a few tricky plays with Harrowing, and you know, I mean, don't get me wrong, there's, there's always plays to be made. 
but it's just not that high of a skill floor, all things considered. I think I think I said that backwards. I meant it is a high skill floor. Anyway, uh, Fearsome's, it's pretty straightforward. There's nothing really fancy to talk about here, except for the fact that we've added in one Moonlight Affliction. Now, we'll see a little bit more of this card being talked about. Um, we'll have to see exactly different versions of Fearsome performing, but in any sort of aggro deck that runs Targon, this card is actually very underrated right now. It's a real force to be reckoned with, and you'll see some examples of that later in this list. All right, next up, we've got my face burn version. Now, burn is kind of like an older archetype. A lot of people know it from the post Bilgewater meta, where for about a month, it was super rampant on ladder. Now, burn comes in, at a 56% win rate pretty solid it's not the tier one status that it used to have and ultimately I think it ends up being a bit of a worse version well I shouldn't say worse version because they have different matchup tables but it's probably ends up being worse than Ezreal burn overall they're kind of doing a similar thing although this one is trying to skip all the control nonsense skip the Faron, and we're just going straight in this one is going to kill the opponent a lot more aggressively and you won't have you know you won't have to worry about killing their units or anything like that so it's basically an aggro deck except unlike normal aggro burn as an archetype usually doesn't play for the board at the very least not in a normal way we're very happy literally completely sacrificing the board on turn two or three dealing a little bit of chip damage in the process and then from a certain point you know usually extremely early we just transition into spells that just deal 10 to 15 damage to the opponent's face to finish them off i'm not really exaggerating either usually our units are only dealing like five to ten damage and then the spells just do most of the nexus health all at once we've got this new card aftershock which is sort of like a flexible mini decimate which is great and in my version of burn i like to run three poro cannons and two arachnoid sentry just as a way of poro cannon providing more flexibility this elusive chip damage and arachnoid sentry is a great flexible defensive or offensive tool nothing feels better than stunning a lifesteal unit it and stopping an entire lose condition because of it now this deck is actually deceptively tricky to play uh, don't get me wrong it's not it's not like brain surgery i have listed it as medium it is aggro and aggro is overall a bit easier than control not in terms of skill ceiling but in terms of skill floor that tends to be true and the reason why it's a bit trickier to play is you often have to be really thinking about the game in terms of you know the turns to kill you have to play to your outs and you have to leverage your resources very precisely. It's very easy for a single mistake to cost you the game with this deck. So if you like this kind of burn playstyle, if you want shorter games, but you want something at least a little bit trickier so you can tell yourself you're a big brain aggro main, this is the deck for you. All right, next up we've got Plaza Targon. Now this one has less of a win rate than Bilgewaters coming in at a 55% win rate overall, but it's still a very solid Plaza deck and a nice alternative if you don't want to play the Bilgewater version. This one plays for a much slower game plan. Usually we're trying to slow down and win with cards such as Aurelian Saul. And because we have such late game value cards, we're often winning these super slow Demacia mirrors. So for example, against something like the Grand Plaza mirror, this version should be a little bit favored. We're running Eclipse Dragon and Aurelian Saul, and we really need to be drawing into them and playing them reasonably early, which is why we're running Dragon's Clutch for that. Just to be able to play Eclipse Dragon on 7 into A Saul on 8. Overall, this is a pretty straightforward deck. My one tip to you is to make sure you're planning a way to get your Radiant Guardians effect off. For example, oftentimes, you, this deck might want to bank mana into turn 5 so that you can play Blinding Assault, Open attack with a Valor, with Scout attack, sacrificing it so that you can play Radiant Guardian the action right after, and still have your attack token for that turn as well. So make sure you're at least thinking a little bit about the next turn when you play this. All right, next we've got Targon Aggro. Targon Aggro is uh, actually pretty good. We're using Noxus and rushing people down with Overwhelms, and some of Targon's aggressive packages like Crescent Guardian and the new card Moonlight Affliction as kind of like a side grade to Decisive Maneuver for this Overwhelm style finisher. In this case, we're trying to run a couple of Riven 
tends to balance out our curve a little bit and because we have more spell based finishers in the form of Moonlight Affliction, Darius becomes a little bit necessary for how we're winning the deck. We're much more likely to take more aggressive open attacks from that position. This is another one we don't have enough sample size to have stats for, however this same archetype has done very very well in the previous meta and it should be a tier 2 deck in this meta, no reason around that. So we'll have to experiment with it a little bit more, see how you know how well the Moonlight Affliction and Wind Condition does work for this deck and that will end up deciding a how to build it a little bit further and b you know how wh whether it's what position in tier two it is because it's probably somewhere in tier two overall it's a fairly easy aggro deck you don't have to do anything crazy for this one you end games very quickly keep in mind this deck is not usually leveling riven riven is more here as a value tool she gives the blade fragments which is actually usually good for this strategy often the overwhelm blade fragment or the plus attack blade fragment will gain value and there will be maybe rare games where Riven does level up and that can be somewhat important. But if you want a deck where Riven is actually kind of more synergistic and playing for more value, probably the most competitive way of using Riven and getting like value out of her in which she is not just kind of like a sort of weaker version of Javen as she is against aggro is this deck, which is Ash Riven. Now, this one is still kind of like yet to be determined exactly how powerful this is, but it's kind of like a new version of Ash Noxus. Similarly, we're getting into kind of like low play rate territory just because as much as this was a popular archetype before the expansion, there's not a lot of people playing it in the last four days, but it's still fairly powerful. What we have here is a kind of mid-range beefy deck. We are playing, you know, slow value cards you know trying to beef out the board with our 5-5 from Yeti 5-5 hearth guard until eventually either overpowering them with an ash attack with freezes or sometimes just this one of Ferran being the way we close out the game Riven here has the ability to level up pretty decently because she is of course a um yeah, it's a slower deck for Riven, and for Riven to level up, you want to play her in a bit of a slower deck, and her Blade Fragments give pretty good synergy here. We can use the plus to attack fragment to, for example, draw an extra card off of Assessor sometimes, Quick Attack can be used with the Glory Seeker, and so on and so forth. Uh, quick Attack on Ash is also really powerful, because Ash needs to attack, but sometimes you can't let them, you know, kill her. Next up, we've got Zoe Elusives, and you know what? It actually brings me to the point, you know, where we're seeing the new champions Riven, we're seeing Zoe, we're seeing Victor, it's time to actually talk about, you know, these champions and how they're fitting into the metagame. For the most part, you know, none of them feel like they're hitting like major tier one positions or even high tier two positions, they're all decent, but I think a lot of people are very surprised at how well Zoe is doing. Zoe is um, very possibly the powerful, the most powerful of the three champions. Uh, she's very solid 1-1 one, one elusive. And she has the ability to draw you a card for free while pressuring the opponent. That's kind of her job as a card, especially in a deck like this. She's not necessarily easy to level up, and it might not necessarily always be worth protecting the level up. But if she strikes the Nexus once, draws you the card, and then forces the opponent to remove her, she's done her job. And that's great, and that's what she does in almost every game. There's some decks that have the ability, if the Zoe does level up, which will happen sometimes, absolutely, to be able to, you know, play a giant keyword that helps close out the game. In this case, you know, Elusive or Lifesteal can be the way to end the game here. Let me get to Give It All Discard, which is a personal favorite of mine. This is a very strange deck to look at but effectively we're using a slightly less aggressive discard strategy we're not using jinx which is typical of discard aggro decks and we're playing for survival skills and give it all survival skills is actually proving to be very good even uh people are running it to great success in normal discard aggro even with jinx and give it all i think fits very well as a side condition for the archetype to replace jinx Overall, it's going to be a little bit better in some matchups than Jinx and a little bit worse in others, but I think it's a fun new way of playing the archetype that feels very much on par with the playstyle. This one's a little bit trickier to play. You will have to plan 
turns in advance to set up the give it all. I think a common misconception is that give it all is a value card. It is truly a finisher. If you're playing it, you want to be finishing the game. And part of the reason I like give it all is because in, for example, like aggro matchups where we're against an aggressive deck, we can basically just kill them on turn five or six. We can always race them no matter what. Because all we do is set up the board in a way where we press give it all on turn five or six and an aggro deck won't be able to stop you. So we can, you know, make everything elusive off of Poro Cannon or Teemo. Sometimes give like a big overwhelm off of crowd favorite plus the stats off of crowd favorite. And that will basically always be enough to close out the game on the spot if you are set up for it. Survival skills, we are never playing this card manually from hand. Okay, I shouldn't say never. There's very rare cases where we can stop an attack by playing it from hand. But we want to be discarding this with Rummage or Draven's Axes when they go in to threaten our strongest ally with damage. Keep in mind, survival skills does not protect against destroy effects like Vengeance and Ruination. Overall, this is a fun combo -y, slightly kind of like slower version of your you know, kind of expected to discard semi-aggro package. All right, we're getting to the end here with Lee Combo. This is a very standard Lee Combo deck. If you know how this deck has played from previous patch, you know exactly how it will look now, but we're running one Spell Thief to try to give that little bit of extra flexibility plus the spell trigger. So it's a deck where we spam spells, trying to keep Lee Sin uh, and Zed and Mountain Goat alive as our main win conditions. And the entire time we're doing that, we are leveling our Lee Sin. Lee Sin with Overwhelm and 10 attack will win the game on the spot if they can't stop his Dragon's Kick with the Overwhelm, because the Overwhelm will deal damage uh, that doubles the dragon kick damage effectively. Overall, it's kind of fallen in popularity, but this is a very fun combo deck. If you want to play a spell heavy, kind of stall combo deck, you know, stopping the opponent from doing what they're doing, and then, you know, eventually playing your flipped lease in and watching as they kind of like cower in fear with no ability to stop you, it's a very fun deck and it's pretty competitive sitting at tier two. Then we've got Victor Zoe. This deck is surprisingly good. There's a there's a decent chance I will move this to tier three next week, but this is probably at the very least from what I've seen the most competitive way of playing Victor. And it might be the best way, it's one of the best ways of playing Zoe as well. This is basically an Elusives cheese deck. In this case, we're using Zenith Blade for Overwhelm. It's not just Elusives, but we're augmenting very, very big values off of Ballistic Bot. Our Assembly Bot is growing as well, and we're going to be stacking Overwhelm on them with Zenith Blade, as well as making sure our Victor is growing and we're overwhelming that too. So basically, we're just trying to protect these units that just gain enormous amounts of attack, and giving them overwhelm. Now, the reason that this deck actually does decently against normal counters to this concept, like Hush and Frostbite, is because we have so many threats for so cheap that eventually those decks will just kind of run out of those tools and you can still win. Sparklefly is a huge hit in this deck because we have the ability to buff it big with tools such as Mentor and all of our buff cards, and a buffed Sparklefly will absolutely pound any aggro decks you face from its lifesteal. And then finally, we get to Tom Soraka. Still a powerful deck, still tier 2, a very unique playstyle as well. Uh, for the most part, we shouldn't, don't look too much into the ordering of these last, like, um, even, honestly, like seven decks. These are all, as I mentioned before, archetypes. We don't have win rate stats on yet, but they were tier two in the last expansion, and there's a very good chance they'll end up being tier two here uh, overall. So Soraka Tom Kench is a sort of semi mid range, semi control player style where you try to get engines to stick onto the board with Soraka and with Tom Kench and protect your units with healing. Star Spring allows you to win the game on the spot if you've healed enough units, but for the most part, Tom Kench ends up being more of a win condition than that because Tom Kench will not outright winning you the game. If you can stick a Tom Kench and protect him while eating the opponent's units, they just lose the game on the spot. To be able to beat aggro, we're running Broadback to Protector, which is kind of just a giant middle finger to aggro overall. They have just no way to out damage the amount of healing that this card provides. It's a very difficult deck to play. This is actually one of the highest skill ceiling decks to play in the entire game. Um, and 
you have to be thinking on your feet a lot. You need to be banking mana in weird positions, thinking a couple of turns ahead, identifying sometimes sort of strange win conditions, sometimes taking very bizarre passes. And what that means is it is a very, very unique kind of combo-y style play style. It, it almost defies categorization, right? You do play for the board. You are a board-dependent deck, and in that way, it's kind of mid-rangey, but you have to play it very flexibly, and there's no easy aspect to this deck. So if you want something that feels different and a challenge, Soraka Tom Kench is probably the perfect deck for you. Anyway, that's it with... The return of Meta Mondays. This is kind of our our you know pilot to the second season, as it, as it were. Wait, pilots never. Yeah, anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is is that that's it. That is the week one meta in a nutshell. A lot of this is probably going to be changing next week. I will try to keep these videos a bit shorter in the future, but it's really difficult because there's actually a lot of cool decks that I want to show off. And I do actually like being able to kind of like talk about the deck a little bit. In some cases, there ends up being a decent amount to say about the deck. So it feels really hard personally. It's a big challenge for me to cut these down time-wise. Anyway, that's it. I hope you guys were able to learn something from this and maybe find a new favorite deck. Let me know how you guys feel about kind of this format. If you guys haven't noticed... Compared to the old, uh, you know, Meta Mondays, I'm trying to explain the decks and how they function. You know, only taking like 30 seconds to do that, but try to make it a little bit more new player friendly as opposed to just being, here's the deck, here's where it's been the meta the past week, which doesn't really make a lot of sense for people that don't really know the game very well to begin with, or maybe are returning players and, you know, there's a completely new archetype they haven't seen before. Anyway, that's it for this video. I will see you guys next time.